you guys doing? Welcome back to another Pay It Forward. I'm your host, Leo Schoolfield, here with Brandon. And today, we got a good one for you guys. We have an absolute pleasure. Please, everybody, welcome Terrilyn. I don't know if there's a little clap thing. But um, Hi, how guys. you doing, Terrilyn? <laughs> so, you know, to kick everything off, welcome to Pay It Forward, where we take, you know, veterans and people who are just inspiring to us and we introduce them to the rest of our community and they give out great tips and advice. So without further ado, guys, please, Terlin, can you tell us who you are, what you do, um, interests and all that? Just tell us about yourself. Sure. Yeah. Um, so my name is Terlin Eisenhower. I am a uh, a, a multi-passionate. I have a lot of different ways that I can go about my bio, but for the purposes of this, I just spent the last four years growing within a company called Catchco, which is a leader in the sport fishing uh, space. And I have done many things there, but, but the reason I'm here is that I've owned our recruitment for uh, four years now. So I've, I've led, you know, over a hundred requisitions, hired over a hundred people, um, at all levels and all departments. And it's just been such a pleasure and such, um, like, I don't want to say a learning curve, but I've just learned so, so much, uh, through that time. And I actually just, uh, ended my time with Catch Co and I'm moving into more of a consulting and coaching space. So one thing that I'm, I'm doing now is a lot of career coaching and my specialty tends to be more so with artists or people with non-traditional backgrounds in, a, in, in more like a liberal arts space versus veterans. But as we were preparing for this podcast and I was thinking about it, there's, there's so much overlap there. And so part of my goal is just to make sure that people, you know, I, I spent so many years on the like interview side of things, the interviewer and the resume reviewer. So I want to use those skills uh, to the people on the other end of the spectrum who are writing the resumes and, uh, you know, being interviewed. So uh, on top of that, I'm also an artist. I'm a poet. Um, I'm in theater and uh, all, all sorts of things. So uh, I'm around. But um, yeah, for purposes of this, I'm, I'm a career coach for people who need help identifying their transferable skills. That's awesome. And you know, the one thing that I just heard you say uh, repetitively too is career coach. Um, is that something that you've always wanted a, like a career in is, or is, was there like something that, you know, you had in mind, but you kind of did like a complete 180 when it came to like your career path? Oh, I've done so many 180s in my career path, <laughs> quite honestly. Uh, I never expected to be where I am today in a million years for so many reasons. Even my job at CatchCo in the people and culture space was a total 180. And now leaving CatchCo, it kind of just fell into my lap, this idea of a career coach, because I come from a theater background. So, so many of my friends like have have just been in awe of the things that I've learned in my corporate time where I've been able to pass along these insights and these skills to them and they've had no idea. So just through casual conversation with friends and connections, I've really helped people like get their resume on track. I've helped them um, negotiate uh, like higher raises. I helped, I helped somebody uh, get $20,000 more in an offer letter once just through coaching. And all of this was free. All of this was just people in my network. And it sounds like people have really gotten a lot out of it. So I am just following this impulse to help more and more people and hopefully make a career out of it myself. That is absolutely amazing. It basically, basically you're like giving back. Yeah. You're, you're like giving back in a sense. And that's what pay it forward is all about is giving back and really showing people different perspectives on the same information, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, with that comes, were there any big struggles, you know, when it came to doing a lot of the one eighties you were saying, and that one's actually a two part. So were there any struggles when it came to the one eighties and then um, can you, can you kind of elaborate on, you know, how important it is to find a career that you actually like, not just one that 
you know, you're just working on just to get from point A to point B. You know, we all have those types of times. You you try to get to the career that you would like. So can you yeah. you kind of you did that? Totally. So um, <laughs> yeah, I think to answer the question, I'll go back and and tell the story of how I actually ended up at Catch Co. So mm -hmm. you know, I. I've told this story so many times. It's very near and dear to my heart. I'll never stop telling it. So I, like I said, have a, a theater background. I went to liberal arts school with a theater degree and um, an American studies degree as well. I got a scholarship after my bachelor's degree and uh, went to New York City with a full scholarship to an acting conservatory. I was living in Brooklyn for a little while. I was auditioning, I was an actor, finished up school there and moved to Chicago took some time. So that was maybe the first 180 of like totals taking a step back. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And so I just waited for a little bit and I bartended and I nannied and I dog walked and I was a Christmas elf. And like, I did every, every odd job you could possibly think of. And at a certain point I was like, okay, paid off my debt, but I don't have much savings right now. What am I doing? what do I want to do? I want like a big, a big kid job. Right. And I went to a temp agency. So I think the first like lesson in my story is like reach out for help because nothing in my life would be where it is right now if I did go to a temp agency. And that was a new thing for me. I didn't know what to expect. There's a wide array of, you know, types of temp agency, quality of placements. And I, ended up at the right place, the right time. I had a fantastic uh, like liaison there who was setting me up on my job interviews. And I got really specific with her about what I wanted because I know that, at, especially at a temp agency, they can slot you anywhere. Sometimes it's literally licking envelopes. And so I said, I am okay with one of two options. I am okay licking envelopes if I'm going somewhere that I'm really passionate about, if I'm going to a, a hospital that is doing breaking ground cancer research, I will, I will open the door for visitors and, and, you know, send the mail. Um, or I want to go to a place that has um, the ability for me to make an immediate impact. I want to show up every day at work and like see what I'm doing and have agency and like see my impact on the company. And I think it only took me a few interviews, but I landed at Catchco and I ended up getting both there where I immediately got an administrative assistant role where I had a lot of agency. I had a lot of responsibility, even more so than originally planned, because by the time I got there, they realized that I could, could, could do a lot more than the job description. And so they gave it to me. Um, and I ended up becoming very passionate about what we were doing there because it was um, catch kids in the outdoor industry. We're getting kids and families outside. You know, we're connecting them with with their local waterways and and nature and each other. So uh, even though I'm not an angler, I, I did become very passionate about the fishing industry. Um, and so I ended up with both. And I think the key of it was that I was specific of what I wanted to feel like and what I wanted my relationship with the work to be, but I didn't know if I wanted to be in HR. I didn't know if I wanted to, um, you know, go into people and culture or even administration. I didn't get, I didn't limit myself by getting too specific at first. I focused more on just how do I want to feel day to day. Um, and then by the time I got there, it was supposed to just be a temporary part-time gig. It was supposed to be like 15, 20 hours a week for four months while somebody was on maternity leave. And I fell in love with the company. I fell in love with my job. And I basically said to myself, at least like, I'm staying here. I'm going to figure out how to do it. And I did. And then it's, you know, it was a four year job at that point. So um, endlessly grateful. And I think in terms of the challenges thing that has been such a lesson for me over the past few years is getting rid of shoulds. So for a while I was like, I, I'm, I, I, I'm supposed to be, I should be acting still, but like, where does that should come from? Where does that supposed to? And so getting rid of the expectations that I thought other people had for me or that I had for myself, giving myself the grace of like, no time is wasted. So just because I did do something 
for X amount of time and then I pivoted, I did a 180, that doesn't mean that that time wasn't worthwhile. That time actually set me up to do the 180 and to get me to where I am today. So I'm a true believer of like, what's meant for you won't miss you. And, you know, getting rid of the shoulds, not completing the course of, of you know, the original plan of action, just because that's what you said you were gonna do. Like you're allowed to change your mind for mm -hmm. humans. That's, that's a birthright. And so, um, yeah, I think most of the challenges were just mental. Most of the challenges were ones that I, I created for myself. Um, so as soon as you get in the mindset that you can, you can change your path, you can do that 180, that things are going to fall into place if you have your priorities straight. Um, and if you're authentic with the people in front of you and, you know, not, not lying, not saying like, Hey, I've never done this before. <laughs> like, you know, um, or actually saying I've never done this before and, and, you know, not gonna, not gonna trick you into thinking I have a background that I don't, mm -hmm. um, and trusting that people will see you and uh want to work with you because of the skills you bring to the table and not because of what your resume says mm -hmm. very agreed very agreed the one thing that you said that really hit home was get rid of the should that's yeah. something that i, I you kind of don't think about it's one of those things that are kind of like creep up in the back of your mind and plant a seed and then you just it's i should i should go to the gym i should study mm -hmm. and then again you got to get rid of the should turn to I will. Yeah. I, really, I truly yeah. agree with that one. That one hit home. Um, Brandon, do you have anything? Uh, no, I, 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 I echo what you just stated as well. And um, I think what, what kind of resonated with me a lot too, as well is, you know, giving, giving yourself that grace to, to, I think a lot of times what happens with anybody, not only our transitioning service members and veterans, um, we, we beat ourselves up on what the, we gave ourselves those expectations for, you know, and it, it, it can be so detrimental to where you think that you can't progress anymore because you should have been in that role and you're not. Yeah. anymore. So yeah. I, I totally agree. I, I have a question for you, too, as well. So. In, in the, the four years that you've done your time to as well, um, you know, in, in that space, as far as recruiting, as well as like saying like that full life cycle, what was the, what has been the hardest piece of that for you? Ooh. In terms of, in terms of what, like hardest how? Uh, you know, it, 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 it may be somebody that you thought that was a really strong candidate and, and they didn't get, you know, the position that you, you thought you they should have or um, I don't know, working with maybe some 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 hiring managers who may be um, strong arm and block their the door too too often, like ha, ha, yeah. have, have any of those issues or. Yeah, so that's a good point because recruitment really is an art and a science and you have to balance it. Every recruiter, every person who's reviewing a resume comes to the table with a different set of biases and a different lens of the world. And there's nobody without biases. There's nobody without preference. Um, it's just a matter of recognizing it. And so being on the other end where I have a job description and like a hiring plan that I've collaborated on with a hiring manager. We've got my opinion about candidates, but maybe we're hiring in the marketing sphere where I don't have experience in marketing. I can't tell you who has more of a, you know, be better experience in CRM than the, than the other person. Like, I don't know. Um, I can look for, key qualities in communication and do they represent our core values and are they, you know, ge generally pleasant to talk to, which doesn't actually always matter even. Um, but I have my things that I'm looking at and then the hiring manager has what they're looking at. Um, and there definitely were times, not, not often, where I would see a candidate, I would get feedback on the candidate, everything you know, it seems awesome. I'm really enthusiastic about them. And then for whatever reason, the hiring manager is like, Ooh, like, mm. I, I actually, I don't know. I don't know. And I go, okay, well, like, like what, what, what aren't they, what check boxes aren't they checking? I don't know. And, and at the end of the day, it's the hiring manager's hire. 
right? And so we really want to have this balance of like, we're looking at competencies, we're looking at skills, we're looking at background, we're looking at core values. And in my dream world, like, you know, it, it would be just a science, right? Does this mm -hmm. person show up and can they do all the things that we need them to do? Mm -hmm. But we're humans. We're humans talking about other humans, working with other humans, slotting humans into a team, and there's nuance to it. And so I think that's the really difficult part sometimes is like, you know, trusting that the hiring manager knows who they're looking for, partnering with them to make sure that they're making the right hire, you know, because at the end of the day, it's not about E either of our egos, right? It's not like, oh, I'm rooting for this candidate and you're rooting for this candidate. Mm -hmm. We're rooting for making the right hire. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, yeah, it's definitely tricky. And I like may maybe the hardest part of my job sometimes was that I just care so much and perhaps too much. And I would get really connected to um, different candidates that we were talking to. And I've stayed in contact with candidates that we didn't even end up hiring that, that are still close in my network. Obviously the people that we do hire, I become very close and attached to and, um, you know, Kachko, if anybody from Kachko is watching this, you know, I love you. Um, <laughs> it's, it's just been, it was such a journey there, but, um, but truly like we're talking about people's lives here. And so it's not just about the job. It's not just about the position. It's about people. And also, if it's only about people, if you're only looking at it, like, would I want to grab a beer with this person? Like, mm -hmm. then you're going to make the wrong hire. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's a it's a tight, tight rope to, to walk down. Totally. No, it is. It is. And I appreciate that. Those were some great key nuggets you dropped there. And no, I, I, I agree with you on all sentiments. I, I find myself, too. I think I, I do get that that very sentiment, like attachment to, to the candidates, and, you know, the, 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 the good ones and you do have also it's, it's a balance but um i think that's the biggest thing i have to have learn how to kind of yeah. you know let go and kind of let the process work itself yeah yeah one of the biggest things i took away from you uh was when you said networking like networking and having that communication with everybody you know either trying to apply for the job already in that workspace so to go with networking how important was it for you to network when it came to you know you developing into the person you are today and getting these that career opportunity how important was it to really network with those people and other people as well that were coming in yeah so my like the start of my career coming into Catch Co, it was definitely more the temp agency than networking because I didn't even have a network. Like, I don't think I had a LinkedIn profile. My resume was a mess. Like, thank you, Catch Co, for hiring me in the first place because, like, again, it's, not, it's more than just what's on paper because I was not, I was not nearly the professional I am today. Mm -hmm. um, but now my network is probably my most important asset and i like just to say it if you're watching this and you're like i don't like the idea of linkedin like screw linkedin like i was right there for so many years i had to learn about linkedin in college and i just like blew it off i was like i'm never gonna use this linkedin is so important linkedin is so 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 crucial and you can hate that fact but it's but it's true um, and you kind of have to get into it and learn how to play the game because recruiters are looking at your LinkedIn. Um, people are searching keywords in LinkedIn to find their, you know, their dream candidate and then they find them. Um, and you could be their dream candidate, but you don't have the right keywords in your profile. You don't have um, a headline. You don't have, you know, an updated job description and you're, you're losing out on potential connections like while you're sleeping if your LinkedIn profile isn't up to date. Mm -hmm. um, so LinkedIn is really, really important. But even beyond that, just having a LinkedIn profile isn't enough. You really need to leverage your network on LinkedIn and also outside of LinkedIn. I am a believer of like shouting into the universe what you want in order to get it. If it's all up in here, nobody knows you're looking for a job. Nobody knows that you want to get into marketing. Nobody knows that you're trying to do a pivot, a 180. Mm -hmm. And once people know, they're going to look out for you because we're 
that's what people do. We look out for each other and they are hoping that you're looking out for them in return. And so as I've been transitioning out of Petchco, just by talking to people, reconnecting with people, reconnecting with people who are like just adjacent to my field, even people that maybe would never hire me or that I never anticipate working with or for, but just talking to them, asking them questions about their lives, letting them know where I'm at. They then go, they send me an email a week later saying, hey, my, uh, my brother-in-law is actually hiring in the HR space. Like here, here's a job description. Mm. Like it is just remarkable how opportunities and people come out from the woodwork as soon as you start vocalizing and connecting with other people. Mm -hmm. Even if you think that person has nothing to offer you, even if you think that person is, you know, like totally far removed from, from like what you want to be doing day to day. If that person, you know, for me, was like an alumni of my college and I, and I meet them out and about, I'm going to grab their information. I'm going to reach out, say hi, say what's up and, and let them learn about me. Um, and so I'm sure there's all sorts of networking opportunities in, in the veterans community. I'm sure. Right. Like, like mm -hmm. meetups or like groups online or support groups or, you know, I, I can only imagine you, you could tell me, but like just reaching out and telling people what you're looking for and asking them questions because you might not know what you're looking for. You might be like me four years ago and say, I want to feel like this at work. I want my general, you know, I, I want to feel like I'm making an impact and I like the idea of being at a startup, you mm -hmm. know, and finding people and asking them questions about their life and what they do. And you could maybe even find out about a job that you didn't even know existed, like a whole career path that you had no idea was even an option for you just by talking to people. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that job, like just blindly applying to job descriptions right now, just going on LinkedIn and searching your job title and, you know, doing application after application after application, like, no, like it's so hard to get a job like that no matter who you are doesn't matter if you're a veteran or if you're a seasoned professional or like anybody that is not how people are getting jobs right now people are getting jobs through networking mm -hmm. um for better or for worse that is the nature of of the job market right now some of the job descriptions the job posts that you're seeing on linkedin aren't even real they're they're formalities for companies to put it up it has to be public for x amount of time before they can hire internally like mm -hmm. it is I don't want to say it's a waste of your time because it's not, but spending an hour every day shooting off 20 job applications blindly in the dark is not going to get you a job as quickly as having one like coffee date every day for a month with mm -hmm. different people in your network and asking them to set you up with one other person that they know and doing a second month having coffee with a new person every day. Mm -hmm. That's how you're going to get a job. I totally agree. Um, the one thing I really pulled from that was when you said being open, basically having an open mindedness to different jobs. Because, um, you know, one thing, if I may, that I've been going through is trying to find like a certain job that I'm good at. But there's different types of things I'm learning about other jobs that I'm finding out like, wow, I shouldn't just close my box to one to expand. Um, and with that, we talked. You just talked about LinkedIn and resumes as well. Is there anything people, um, vets included, can do to help kind of make their resume stand out? I know they talk about the analogy about how there's always a stack of resumes. It's the same format, and people are just like, "Oh man, resumes." Um, is there anything that you know you've done or that you've seen that help people's resumes really like catch your eye and stand out? Yeah. So this, again, this is a question that's full of nuance because every person who's reviewing resumes, whether it's a, you know, recruitment coordinator or, um, you know, somebody like just who's doing all sorts of people and culture stuff or the hiring manager, everybody's going to have a different preference at the end of the day. I know that some people love creative resumes. Um, I would say for the most part, I actually would steer away from trying to do anything to, like unique or eye-catching with your resume because a resume gets you an interview. A resume doesn't get you a job. Your, your job with a resume is to get an interview. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you want your resume to be 
edited well, you want it to be comprehensive, you want it to be thorough and professional, you want it to be formatted well, um, even little things like you want it to be in a PDF format versus a Word document. There's so much more that you can pour your energy into in terms of making your resume stellar that does not involve creative formatting that I think is, is a much better use of your time. Mm -hmm. um, on the other end, if you are getting into like social media or um, something like gra graphic design, something a little bit more fun and artistic, I will say the best resume I have ever seen and probably will ever see was one of my first hires at Catchco. We were hiring a social media associate, so entry level, somebody to be on Instagram, be on uh, TikTok. Their resume was broken down into a, so, something like, I might butcher it a little bit, but it's like why I'm proud of me, why my dad's proud of me, and why you should be proud of me. Oh, wow. Like, and it was like, and it was so, there was like planets, it was like a space theme, and then there was like a little like astrology joke in the corner, and then like, but then the, the experience was spot on too. Mm -hmm. I was laughing, I, and that got the interview, right? That person then interviewed and did their did their exercise and um, you know got got the job on their own. But that resume for a social media associate working at a brand with a very specific sense of humor mm. was spot on. Unless you were applying for that kind of job, I would say no pictures, no crazy fonts, no crazy colors. Like get get it really solid, really professional especially if you're applying to big companies, they often have AI doing the first screen. Um, so again, I would say even more so than getting creative, making targeted resumes. So changing your resume and it's tedious, which is why in, in this case, um, quality over quantity with job descriptions, job posts like, like tailor your resume to each job that you're applying for, making sure those keywords are in there, making sure that all of the um, like requirements for the job are in your resume somewhere so that a person or maybe even a, like a computer can see, okay, this person that can at least get to the second round here. Um, and on that note, AI I, like, is crazy right now. If you have been living under a rock, you, you, you know, it's like, it's just wild. There's so many resources out there for resume writing through AI that are free or cheap, like use your resources there. Don't get too creative, get thorough. And AI is like an incredible tool for this now. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, um, you know, I've been doing a lot of these lives and the one thing a lot of my guests always say is, you know, make sure you tailor your resume to the job description that will help you substantially when it comes to getting that job. Um, I guess the final question with resumes would be, um, what is your views on cover letters? I've had a lot of opinions about, hey, you should do a cover letter. Hey, it won't hurt if you do a cover letter. Hey, don't do a cover letter. Do you have an opinion about cover letters? Oh, man. Cover <laughs> letters are, it's like a love-hate relationship. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be totally honest here. If I was recruiting for a role and we made the cover letter optional. Mm -hmm. And there was hundreds of applications, right? Like there was it just huge, huge volume. I would often only consider applicants who went the extra mile and attached a cover letter. Was that the best course of action? Did we miss incredible candidates that way? Quite possibly, but especially if you're applying to a company with limited bandwidth, that like showing that you're going the extra mile can really go a long way. Mm -hmm. That being said, did I read every single word of every single cover letter that was ever submitted and analyze it and spend five minutes with it before, you know, rejecting or advancing a candidate? No. Um, and so my thoughts on cover letters are submit them when you can. They don't need to be an essay. They don't need to take you an hour every time. Um, if you are submitting a cover letter, it should say something different than your resume does. It shouldn't just say your resume, but in paragraph form mm -hmm. instead of, instead of 
bullet points, like, tell me a story. Tell me why you're interested in this role. Specifically, since we're here talking about veterans, like, tell me why you're applying to this role with the background that you have. Tell me, like, I, I honestly always appreciated people saying, hey, I know my background doesn't look right for this, but here's why it is. Mm -hmm. here is. Here is why this experience transfers into being able to, you know, work, work with data sets. Like, mm -hmm. I think, especially for this audience, cover letters would be really important in telling the story. Um, are the recruiters gonna read your cover letter top to bottom, they're not going to. Should it still be perfect with no grammatical errors? Absolutely. Like it is such a double-edged sword. It is kind of hypocritical, um, but I would say have maybe three different versions of your cover letter that could apply to different sized companies, different kinds of roles that you're applying for and use those as skeletons, edit them slightly to fit the job description you're applying for and include them. Mm -hmm. um, it shows that you're going the extra mile. It helps tell the story, um, but don't, don't spend more than, you know, don't spend like hours on every single cover letter starting it over. Um, mm -hmm. AI is also really good to help with cover letters. Obviously edit it, make it your own, but um, there, there are resources out there to make it way less tedious. Thank you so much. I know there was, like I said, there's a lot of opinions whether you should make one, not make one. Hey, it doesn't really matter if you make one. So I, I really truly appreciate your opinion on cover letters. Um, I'll, I'll definitely. If there's get no it. right answer, by the way. Like, don't take like. <laughs> there's no right answer. So this is my opinion, but um, it's tr like I would say the only wrong answer is just like never do a cover letter because mm -hmm. if they're optional, if there's an option for them, it can only help to include them. I don't think it would ever hurt unless, you know, it's chicken scratch, which it wouldn't be. Um, but yeah, it, but like, don't take for what, what I'm saying as, as gospel because it really, it's so, it so depends on whoever's on the other end. Hmm. Gotcha. Brandon, do you have anyone? I mean, yeah. any thing? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I think that, that that was a lot of good info we got there to the network and I re really appreciate you Bringing, bringing that into and giving us that time of your day. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I am active on LinkedIn. If anybody, you know, who's watching this is interested in some coaching or interested in figuring out how to maybe like format their resume to highlight transferable skills uh, to make them more relevant. Again, I, I often, my background is working with uh, people with artistic backgrounds, but it's really, it's really the same. I don't know how often um, artists and veterans get compared to each other, but it, it really feels like the same exact uh, hurdle here. Um, so I'd be happy to work with, um, work with any listeners here. And, you know, it's, it's tough out there. The job market is, is a, like the wild west right now. It's different than I've ever seen it. And so like, don't get disheartened and just, just keep on keeping on because there is light at the end of the tunnel, but like, it's just, it's difficult right now. So uh, lean into your network, I guess, is the, the biggest piece of advice I could give to, to end this. Thank you so much, Tara Lynn. We truly do appreciate your time and, you know, all the great information that you have basically stated and blessed everybody who is watching this with was phenomenal. And thank you. Again, thank you so much for paying it forward. And we truly appreciate you. Absolutely. I appreciate you guys too. And um, thank you for doing this. And thank you for inviting me on. This was such a blast. Thank you so much. Thanks.